USA. We will close the border permanently if need be. Congress fund the wall. Jeff Paul has the latest from the U.S. side of the San Ysidro crossing this morning for us. Jeff, good morning. Yeah, good morning. A tense moments here along the border at the San Ysidro port of entry. And as I take a look behind me, uh, seemingly it is now back to normal. But at one point it got so bad that U.S. Customs and Border Protection were forced to close down all traffic moving in and out of the U.S. Now, during the demonstration, federal authorities ended up firing tear gas and pepper balls as migrants tried to force their way into the U.S. Customs and Border Protection says it did so after several migrants tried to breach the border at several different spots, saying some personnel were assaulted and then hit with rocks. This all started as a march where hundreds of migrants from the caravan had planned to move from the sports complex that they're living at in Tijuana to the port of entry. Several of those migrants rushed the border were detained while others nearby the chaotic scene did their best to run to safety. When we went to that side, it was when they started throwing tear gas at us, and there were many children who fainted, many young children fainted. My daughter also got gassed, pregnant woman, and there were many men who also fainted. Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen says that anyone who is found violating some of those laws along the border will be uh, processed uh, to the fullest extent of the law. Sandra? Jeff, how is the other side of the border responding to all of this? Yeah, the mayor of Tijuana tweeted out that he will not let the migrant caravan disrupt the bi-national relationship that they have with the U.S. The Mexican government says it will deport about 500 migrants who they say tried to cross the border. Several arrests were also made on both sides. We're also not getting any word just yet if another march or demonstration is planned in the future. We should also mention that we saw several resources out here from the U.S. side, not just personnel on the ground, but also some choppers in the air viewing what was happening. Sandra? Jeff Paul, thank you. All this giving fuel to the arguments about protecting the border. I want to bring in Byron York now, Chief Political Correspondent, Washington Examiner. Byron, how you doing? Hope you had a lot of trip to fan Good. over the weekend. Time to, Good time to morning, get Bill. back to work. Kirsten Nielsen says this, all right, quote on screen. DHS will not tolerate this type of lawlessness and will not hesitate to shut down ports of entry for security and public safety reasons. We will also seek to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law anyone who destroys federal property, endangers our frontline operators, or violates our nation's sovereignty. So what are we missing, Byron? Well, I think some members of the administration are feeling vindicated right now. Remember, for a number of weeks, we have been told that this caravan was far, far away from the United States, that it might never enter the United States, that it was my, mostly uh, families with children who would not try to force their way into uh, the United States. And I think the events in Tijuana at the San Ysidro Crossing uh, basically are a confirmation uh, that at least there are certain parts of this group uh, who very much want to want a confrontation and try to enter the United States any way they can. So I would look for uh, more Republicans to uh, express or perhaps strengthen their already strong support for the president on the issue of border security. Does that last part it goes to the politics of it then, huh? Politically speaking, you believe Republicans get further behind the president's policies. Well, the polls show that, that large numbers of voters uh, support border security. They may be divided on when you bring up the issue of an actual wall, uh, but they support border security. And, and yesterday, for example, uh, Senator Joni Ernst, the Republican from Iowa, uh, appeared on television and said, of course you would like the border to remain open, but national security comes first. So I think uh, unless there's some sort of dramatic change uh, in this story, you're going to see even stronger Republican support for the president on this. Let's talk about Mexico's position. Jeff Paul just referred to it. Here is what the mayor of Tijuana said on Facebook and Twitter. Here's the quote. The people of Tijuana will not pay for the stay of these migrants, so I will not send Tijuana into debt, just like I've been able to avoid the last two years. We are dealing with the humanitarian crisis, and the federal government must step up to its responsibility. That is reflecting on the current governorship there in Mexico. But you have an incoming government that will be new, brand new very soon. So how does this relationship work at that point, Byron? Well, that's going to be absolutely key. And, you know, we had reports in the last few days that the incoming uh, Mexican administration had basically agreed to an arrangement whereby 
uh, migrants could apply for asylum into the United States when they were physically in Mexico. That is, they would not cross into the United States, but apply for uh, asylum while they were in Mexico. That would be uh, a huge change. That was reported to be sort of a done deal. Then later there were reports that it's not exactly a done deal. Uh, but how Mexico deals uh, with this crisis, and by the way, many of these migrants are, are not Mexicans. They are, they are uh, Central Americans, Guatemalans, Hondurans who have come up through Mexico toward the United States. How Mexico deals with that is going to be absolutely critical. I wonder how many more caravans are behind them. I, I think at last count it was two, maybe three, maybe more than that. We don't know, do we? Well, administration officials would tell you that how this one is dealt with will have a huge effect on the whether there are future caravans because there's always been an argument over uh, an incentivizing effect. That is, if you allow people to come to the United States illegally, then you allow them to go into the United States while they're supposedly waiting uh, for some sort of adjudication on their asylum claim, then you just encourage more people to come. So how this is handled will probably have a big effect on how many more are on the way. Thank you, Byron. Good to see you. Birmingham, Alabama Thank you, Bill. today. Nice to see you. Thank you, Byron. To that point, the president will be back on the campaign trail heading to Mississippi a little bit later ahead of tomorrow's runoff Senate election between incumbent Republican Cindy Hyde-Smith and Democrat Mike Espy. The president tweeting about the race yesterday ahead of several campaign events saying this, Mississippi, vote for Cindy Hyde-Smith on Tuesday, respected by all. We need her in Washington. Thanks. Jonathan Saris live from Jackson, Mississippi with the latest there. So Jonathan set it up for us. What will the president be doing out there? Yeah, good morning to you, Sandra. President Trump is planning rallies with Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith in both Tupelo and Biloxi later today. He campaigned with her back in October, you may recall. Six months ago, Hyde-Smith was appointed to fill the seat of Senator Thad Cochran and is running as a Republican in a solidly red state. Although she led a three-way general election in November, she was unable to win a majority, forcing the race into tomorrow's runoff. But as we know, one vote matters, and that's why this race is so important. And it's so important that we send a conservative in Cindy Hyde-Smith to Washington to support President Trump in case he does have another opportunity to confirm a conservative to the Supreme Court. Now, the outcome of tomorrow's runoff will not affect Republican control of the Senate, but it will affect by how much Republicans control the Senate. And the fact that the president is visiting Mississippi later today just shows how seriously the GOP is taking this, Sandra. Well, uh, Jonathan, President Trump won Mississippi by more than 18 percentage points back in 2016. So how is it that this Senate race has gotten so competitive? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Well, during the campaign trail, Hyde Smith made several gaffes. She, at one point, she joked about attending a hanging, another time joking about making it more difficult for liberals to vote. She says she meant, uh, she meant these in jest. However, given Mississippi's uh, history of racial lynchings and voter suppression, many people were offended. Take a listen. Senator Hyde Smith has been our senator for about 30 seconds, and she continues to embarrass us say these things that draw the wrong kind of national attention. And I think it's created an opportunity for Mike Espy. Democrat Mike Espy is making a final push to get out the vote. Later this morning, he plans to meet and greet voters at a union hall. And then this evening, he plans to speak at a gospel event. But Espy has some political baggage of his own, including having to step down as agriculture secretary during the Clinton administration amid accusations of improperly accepting gifts. He was acquitted of that, but now faces new criticism for accepting a lucrative lobbying deal from Ivory Coast, whose former president faces international war crimes charges. Espy's opponent is trying to portray him as a big spending Washington liberal. Sandra? A lot to watch there. Jonathan Sari, thank you. That election still going on? Yeah. <laughs> and here uh, we are. Well, we were past that, right? A lot of the polling suggests that she's got about a 10 point lead, but the president makes two stops later today, as Jonathan just pointed out. A lot so. at stake there. You'll be in Biloxi a bit later yep. today, a big rally at the Coast Coliseum, 8 p.m. Yep. And oh. as we've pointed out, if she gets a victory now, you're at 53 in the U.S. Senate for the next two years. Meanwhile, breaking news, another big story today. We're watching this. The U.N. Security Council holds an emergency session two hours from now. Russia fired on a U.S. ally on Sunday. 
Is that an act of war? How should the U.S. respond? We'll look into that coming up today. Plus, Democrats say they aim to find out whether Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker plans to interfere with the Mueller probe. Former Attorney General Michael Mukasey will join us. We'll get his take on that. Plus, there's this. People act differently when there aren't cameras in the room. Uh, trust me when I say that. They're very constructive interviews when there is no camera. Do not ask us to limit 17 months worth of decision making to five minutes of questions. There's Trey Gowdy now. He wants to get Loretta Lynch and James Comey back on the Hill again one more time. Mike Johnson from the House Judiciary Committee will respond to all of that coming up next live right here. We have a, a constitutional responsibility for oversight. Months of high-stakes negotiations. British Prime Minister Theresa May must now convince Parliament that to approve that deal, a vote likely to happen in mid-December, and it could be close. Some lawmakers are already calling it a bad deal. Next hour, one of the fathers of the original Brexit movement, Nigel Farage, will join us with his take. Leaks are counterproductive, whether Jim Comey's doing it, whether the FBI is doing it, or whether Congress is doing it. The remedy for leaks is not to have a public hearing where you are supposed to ask about 17 months worth of work in five minutes. I think the remedy is to videotape the deposition, videotape the transcribed interview. Trey Gowdy there offering a solution for getting answers out of James Comey, uh, the former FBI director refusing a subpoena to sit down for a closed-door interview with House Republicans. Louisiana Republican Mike Johnson, also on the House Judiciary Committee. Sir, how are you? And welcome back here, live from Shreveport, uh, Louisiana. What do you think happens here? What gives on this? Well, I, I don't know whether we're going to do it in open or closed session, but I, I do think we need our, our questions answered. We've been at this for a long time. As you know, Bill, the House Judiciary Committee, the House Oversight Committee have had joint investigations ongoing for many, many months, and we have as many questions now as we have answers. So I, I understand what Trey's saying, what Gowdy said. Uh, maybe the, the videotape is a, is a good solution. He and I have both done a lot of videotape depositions in our time. The concern here is that if, if portions of the tape are, are presented later, excerpts are used, of course critics will say that the video was edited somehow. So it's almost a no-win situation. The point is we have to have Comey under oath. I, I like the closed-door session myself because I think witnesses are more candid and we have a lot of important and, and, and sensitive information to seek. Okay, so then if you do closed-door session and there is no videotape, you know the leaks can go in any direction you choose. But if you do the videotape, release the entire videotape to the public, we can watch it together. What's wrong with that? Well, th that's probably what we'll wind up doing. I, I, you know, either way, as long as we get the, uh, the, the questions answered, that's what the, the committee members are concerned about. I if we release the entire tape to the public, I suppose people will claim that it's edited, but they'll have to judge for themselves. Oh. Th look, the point is we have an oversight responsibility here. We have a constitutional responsibility as the Congress on these committees of jurisdiction to make sure that our top law enforcement agencies were not acting with a bias. Okay. And right mm -hmm. now, with mm -hmm. all the evidence we've been given, all the investigation we've done over the last many months, we have real concern about that. And I think the buck stopped at former director, FBI Director Comey's desk and ultimately at Attorney General uh, Lynch's desk, and that's why we have to bring them in. This is not about politics at all. It's about maintaining the integrity of our system of justice, and I, I think the American people are very concerned Let about that. Let me just break this down one by one here. T take James Comey first. What is the critical question mm -hmm. that must be answered with him? Well, look, we know from the evidence that's been gathered and presented and, and, and uh, reviewed thus far that uh, Director Comey, when he was in charge of this, he exonerated Mrs. Clinton, for example, in the Clinton email uh, scandal investigation. He exonerated her before the FBI, FBI investigation was completed and even before key witnesses, including Mrs. Clinton herself, were, were spoken to. Uh, that's a real problem. We also know that the agent in charge of both the Clinton investigation and the Trump campaign investigation, which is Peter Strzok, as we all know by now, uh, had a, clearly had a bias in favor of Mrs. Clinton and, and against President Trump, then candidate Trump. So these are real problems. We think it taints the overall investigations on, on both accounts. And, and we've got a lot of questions yet to be answered it about both like, of those things. Uh, At I the end of the day, you, Comey has the answers. You, right, I wanted to ask you, what the specific question is for Loretta Lynch. But based on that answer, it seems like the questions fold one into the other. Would that be a fair reading of it? 
Well, I think they're all connected. They really are. And, and again, at the end of the day, this is about the American people's faith in our institutions. It's bigger than these investigations, Bill. It's, it's bigger than these particular cases. It's about, uh, it's about the people's faith in our system of justice. And, and that's ultimately, at the end of the day, what keeps us up at night. That's what our responsibility is as the Congress, to make sure that this system of justice is being implemented with integrity. And, uh, and, and that's an important thing that we've got to get down to the bottom to. Mm -hmm. Everyone will ultimately draw their own conclusions, but the, the American yeah. people deserve but the facts, question. and that's what we're after. Last question. Republicans are lame ducks in the House. How much does that concern you, getting the answers now or never? Well, we, we do have, I think, the, the clock ticking uh, towards the end of the year. I commend Chairman Goodlatte on the House Judiciary Committee for, for calling uh, for these hearings. And, and we've, as, as I said, we've been at this a long time. We deserve those. I don't think it'll take long to get those answers, but we have to get both of these persons under oath, and, and that's an important thing for us to get done. Thank you for your time. Mike Johnson, the Republican from Louisiana. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Bill. Sandra. A new tell-all. <laughs> Inside the White House. The attacks that this president has faced since the day that he won the election in November of 2016 have been unprecedented. The big part of what we outline in this book is how the intelligence community went after the president through the Pfizer application process. So do they have a point? We're going to take all this up. Also, police respond. Accurate. <laughs> it misses over 30 <laughs> percent of all pancreatic cancers. In addition, it's pricey. It costs $800 per test and is not covered by insurance. So it's not an option for low income patients. In addition, pancreatic I mean, cancer is a non-symptomatic disease. Happens, you know? That means I that mean, all of its symptoms are really general, such as abdominal way. pain, jaundice. Right. And so a doctor can't easily diagnose it. I don't know if you need to. So then I started yeah, making a scientific a criteria that I would imagine a sensor that was optimal would have. You know, it would have to be simple, city, sensitive, sometimes selective, sometimes rapid, right. inexpensive, and well, minimally invasive to a patient. I was pretty United confident that I could create such a sensor, but I wasn't quite sure how. And then I started doing a bit more research, and I found out why such a technological advancement had been made. What I found is that due to the daunting nature of the discovery, no work has really been done on this. What is happening with pancreatic cancer when you diagnose it? You're looking for a cancer biomarker, or a protein that's found at higher levels in your bloodstream. And this sounds really straightforward, but it's anything but. You see, you have all this healthy blood, leaders and leaders of healthy blood, but you're looking for this tiny increase in this tiny amount of protein that's next to impossible. Essentially what you're doing is you're looking for a needle on a haystack, but worse, you're looking for a needle in a nearly identical stack of needles. And so then what I did is I began researching because I had to find some target to look at. And I started actually with a database of over 8,000 different proteins found in pancreatic cancer. Luckily, on the 4,000th fourth try, I finally hit gold, and I found this protein that I could use. Its name was mesothelin, and it's just your regular protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer, in which case it's found at a highly expressed level, a highly overexpressed, like really high levels in your bloodstream. And then the key about this protein is that it's found early in the disease, when a patient has close to 100% chance of survival. And so if I could detect this protein, then I could hopefully cure pancreatic cancer, basically. Now, early Monday, and so then I shifted my focus to trying to detect the protein clash, because that was the big question. To provoke conflict. Now, Sandra, so far, and the White House my breakthrough came in the most unlikely of places. Clash, it came in high school biology class, the absolute like horror of the UN Security like, Council meeting. Again, will be happening in just under two hours, and we are told by the White House that the president has been briefed on the situation. Sandra, Trey Yanks, thank you. So I basically smuggled in this article on single-walled carbon nanotubes I had been dying to read. And a single walled carbon nanotube is essentially an atom thick tube of carbon that's just imagine a really long pipe and it's 150 thousandth the diameter of your hair and it has these amazing properties they're super super cool and they're like the superheroes of material science and so then i was 
just trying to roll over this concept of we are learning about antibodies. And antibody is basically a lock and key molecule that attaches specifically to a certain protein, in this case, the mesothelin. And I was trying to combine that specific reactivity to how carbon nanotubes are really sensitive to their network, all the um, three-dimensional structures of their network. And then it hit me. What I could do is I could put an antibody in this network such that it would react specifically to, to the mesothelin, and then also it would change its electrical properties based on that amount of mesothelin. Was and is working to make a difference, what would you like the power to do? Trading underway this Cyber Monday. The Dow starting strong, up triple digits out of the gate. Look at that. A minute into trading and a nearly 200-point gain on the Dow. Some of those tech stocks that have been beaten up over the last couple of weeks seem to be bouncing back today. And, and maybe rightly so, considering this is Cyber Monday, when everybody comes back from the Thanksgiving mm -hmm. holiday, they sit down at their computers back at work and they start shopping online. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, of course, Bill. Don't let the boss know, right? <laughs> a lot of headwinds right now. We talked about them all throughout the, uh, the month of November. Some of them, are the, I mean, they're still out there. So oh, yeah. we'll, we're, uh, we're fighting against the tide a little bit so far. So 931 up triple digits. Nice to see. In the meantime, from overseas, watch this. UK's parliament obtaining a set of internal documents out of Facebook that the company has long sought to not make public. Reports suggest the confidential files may provide evidence of blatant disregard for user privacy. So what does all that mean for you? Greg Pelicott's on it live in London with more now. Hey, Greg. Hi, Bill. Some uh, important information uh, emerging this morning on this very important story. Pressure building on Facebook on this side of the Atlantic. A committee of the UK Parliament investigating Facebook and especially consumer privacy and data mining. It has seized documents from a businessman involved with a Facebook third party app while on a trip here in London. Those documents could expose what Facebook chief Mark Zuckerman knew and when he knew about the sharing of Facebook users' personal information for the use of other firms. One big reason why the UK is involved in this is that Cambridge Analytica uh, based uh, here in the UK. He came out earlier this year that they, they had used personal information in tens of millions of unknown Facebook users, uh, and including that information for use by the Trump campaign. The Parliamentary Committee is looking at making those documents public and could do so next week. They say they are within their rights, even though that app firm is involved with its own legal scuffle in the United States. They're trying to keep a lid on those documents. British lawmakers are holding a hearing on uh, secrecy involving social media and the use of disinformation. They had invited, in fact, Facebook Chief Mark Zuckerberg to appear at a hearing tomorrow. He's a no-show, decided not to friend them. Mm. Back to you. It goes on. Thank you, Greg Palcott, on that from London. Thank you, Greg. Sandra. We are going to bring Whitaker before the Congress. One of the key decisions that the Attorney General will make, whoever's in that role, is when Bob Mueller puts together a report on, among other things, obstruction of justice, will that report be shared with the American people? Will it be shared with Congress? The American people need to know, they deserve to know, whether their president is interfering with the impartial administration of justice. Well, likely incoming House Intel Committee Chairman Adam Schiff continuing his public feud with President Trump, promising to get to the bottom of Matthew Whitaker's appointment as acting attorney general and whether Whitaker plans to interfere with the Mueller investigation. For all this, we turn to former Attorney General Michael Mukasey. He joins us on set this morning. Michael, good to have you here this morning. Good so to be with you. You just heard it from Adam Schiff. He is vowing to bring Whitaker before Congress. He believes that this appointment was unconstitutional. Uh, in his words, he believes the acting AG was chosen by the president for the purpose of interfering with the Mueller investigation. Is there anything that you have seen or heard that indicates to you or concerns you about Whitaker's ability to carry out his position? One word? No. Um, Matt Whitaker's appointment was lawful and, as it turns out, constitutional. I had some doubts about that. Um, the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the government's principal go-to office for legal opinions, issued a 20-page opinion describing 200 years of, of practice in which people who fit Matt Whitaker's description have been appointed as acting heads of agencies. And so I think, it's, I think it is constitutional. Um, that said, I think it would be a good idea if the president put uh, somebody 
uh, at least put somebody forward uh, for nomination uh, to be the permanent attorney general, and that can't be Matt Whitaker. That would be unlawful. So you, you're not allowed to nominate an acting. So he ought to basically focus on who's going to do that. it long term. Right? Well, one of the complaints that you hear from Adam Schiff and other Democrats who are uh, opposed to Whitaker being in this position is that he's not being transparent enough, not communicating to Congress his intentions. Does he need to be more transparent with Congress? He's not there to communicate with Congress. He's there to run the Justice Department. Um, and for him to be simply talking to Congress, that's not, that's not his job. It wasn't my job when I was there. Uh, if Adam Schiff wants to find out what his intentions are, he intends, I guess, to subpoena him. But to talk about obstruction of justice, I think, really misreads the law. An investigation um, is not subject to the obstruction statute. Uh, the obstruction statute has to do with obstructing a proceeding. And there's a lot of law to the effect that an investigation is not a proceeding. So we can put that aside. Secondly, the Mueller investigation for what it's done is, is appears to be nearing the end. Um, and finally, um, there hasn't been, I mean, Mueller was put in place to determine whether there was a crime committed um, in relation to a relationship between the president or his campaign and the Russians. So far, there has been nothing on that score. Zero. When you talk about the Mueller investigation coming to a close and what happens when that report is actually generated and then who will see it, Alan Dershowitz uh, was on one of the Sunday programs over the weekend and he had this to say about its conclusion. I think the report is going to be devastating to the president and I know that the president's team is already working on a response to the report and so at some point when the report's made public, it will be made public probably with a response alongside. Trying to figure out exactly what that means there because he says he does not believe that it will criminally implicate the president, but he says it will be politically devastating to the president. What do you think he meant by that? I have no idea what he meant, and um, although I like and know Alan Dershowitz for years, I'm not sure that he knew what he meant either. Um, if what he's saying is that that uh, the report is going to contain a lot of innuendo, then um, obviously the president is going to respond. He says the president is already working on drafting a response to a report that hasn't been that hasn't been released yet. So it's it's sort of everybody knows what everybody else is going to say. To I be guess. clear, he said the critical questions are largely political when it comes to this report. When he says a devastating, just to make sure he gets his words in here in, in defense of Dershowitz, I mean, it's going to paint a picture, he said, that's going to be politically very devastating. Uh, he says this will instead lay out the facts of the case. Um, he su suggested that the president's more legally vulnerable when ma in matters related to his business. So I wanted to make sure I get that in there. As far as the report itself. By the way, the, 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 the special prosecutor was not put there to investigate the president's business. So if that's going to be in his report, it's going to be off the mark. Perhaps that's why he's saying then politically devastating, right. not criminally. So when it comes to the report itself, it's up to Whitaker whether or not the public gets to see this, right? Well, in the first instance, I suppose, although, as you know, Washington leaks like a sieve. Um, somebody once said that the ship of state is the only ship that leaks from the top. Um, and obviously, whether, whether Matt Whitaker releases it or not, somebody is going to get it out there. So it'll be out there. If you're Whitaker, do you release it? Sure, because there's no, there's no point in, in, in trying to keep it secret. The president's going to respond, and it'll come out as President Dershowitz said with his response. Finally, I want to ask you about this rare re rebuke of a sitting president by a, by a Supreme Court Justice, John Roberts, uh, firing back at the president for what he referred to as an Obama judge. It's very rare to see this sort of public sparring between a sitting president and a Supreme Court justice. It is rare, um, although it's happened before President uh, Obama in his, in his 2010 State of the Union. Uh, criticized the Supreme Court to their face. They were sitting right in the audience. And uh, he, uh, he issued a rebuke to them over the Citizens United decision. In fact, you may recall that Justice Alito um, was sitting there mouthing the words, not true, not true, right? And um, so there's been this kind of exchange before. It's, it's not real attractive. The fact is that judges are there to enforce the Constitution and, and generally do their level best. On the other hand, um, judges do come with opinions and points of view, um, and uh, 
Very interesting to see that play out. And, and by the way, before I let you go, it's great to have you on set this morning. It is yes. a very special day for someone close to you. It is a very special day for my wife. Uh, it is her birthday, and I want to wish her a happy birthday and tell everybody that there's nothing I've ever done since we've been married that's been worthwhile that I've done without her help. Very lovely. Very lovely to hear that. And happy birthday to her. Happy Michael birthday, Lucchese. Susan. Thank you very much, Susan. All right, Bill. She's a sweet woman, too. Happy birthday. Nice to see you, sir. Big week in the NFL. We start in Minneapolis late last night, Sunday night. The Vikings denying the Green Bay Packers. Minnesota's got a great stadium, and they got a good win, 24-17, the final over Green Bay. The Packers stay winless on the road for this season. Playoffs do not look good. Meanwhile, <clears throat> The battle for Ohio was a mess for Cincinnati. <laughs> Man, the Bengals lost at home to Cleveland. 35 to 20, the final. That ends Cleveland's 25 game losing streak on the road. Quarterback Baker Mayfield setting a Browns rookie record four touchdown passes. There's one of them. I mean, you weren't paying attention to nice. any of this, Bill Hemmer. Correct on that. It's, do we have one more? Yeah, just, for, just for grins. One, yeah, there wow. we go. Thanks, guys. Just rub it in. What a weekend for football, you know, huh? It, if your team's having a problem, you play Cincinnati. Mm. Everything works out. <laughs> The way it is in the league. All right, what a weekend. We won't yes. mention that uh, seven overtime. Oh, Mom, I'm so Whoa. sorry, kid. We'll talk more about that a yes. little bit later. I need some more time. Meanwhile, a new tell all book from two top Trump insiders giving a deeper look into the White House. What we're saying here in the book is the media, the media, the Republican establishment, and the intelligence services, not together, but separately, are undermining this president. Both Corey Lewandowski and David Bossy say some of the, pres the president's biggest enemies are, quote, embedded in the White House. We'll take that one up next with someone who worked in the West Wing for years. Language about enemies and treason, about policy and politics, is pretty warped. And I think most Americans think it's weird.